Hello, Giants fans, and welcome to a new edition of the Valentine's Views podcast here on Big Blue View Radio. If you're listening across the uh, the Big Blue View Radio network, please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're watching us on YouTube, please like, share, and subscribe there as well. With your New York Giants at uh, five and one, a, a surprising, incredible, crazy five and one. Heading into week seven against the Jacksonville Jaguars. I'm joined today by uh, by Mark Schofield to uh, try to make sense of uh, uh, of what's going on with the Giants. Mark, how you doing? I'm doing well, Ed. It is great to be here. Excited to talk a little, a little Giants with you. Excited to catch up a little bit before the show. Ed, excited. Look, we're co-workers now. I know I was going to say that's 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 uh, you know, I was going to make sure that I congratulated you on on the new position as an SB Nation NFL writer. Awesome to uh, to have you with uh, with us full time now. So uh, congratulations. Thank you, my friend. It's it's super fun. We're doing across the entire network. I mean, we're we're doing incredible work. I, you know, see what you're doing over at Big Blue View. You, you're crushing it as always. The guys down at uh, everybody, the men and women over at Bleeding Green, crushing it. Blog of the boys. I mean, the NFC East is just kind of crushing it generally uh, on the network, which is great. But um, I'm excited to be here, man. It's it's been far too long since we chatted. I know it has. You know, you've been uh, you, you've been you've been putting me off here since you're a big time, you. big time, full time guy. So, so now that, so now that I've got you pinned down, you and that new growth on, on top of your lip there, uh, for, uh, you know, for those, uh, for those who are, are listening on the podcast network, Mark's got a little, got a little mustache working and yeah, yours truly the Halloween costume friends. Yours truly has a has a very gray, scruffy little beard working too. So, uh, so the people so, watching on YouTube, they can see some gray hair from me. So, all right. So, so here it is, Mark. I I write for one site. I cover the Giants. Yep. You are the big time SB Nation NFL writer, columnist, feature guy now, which means you work for everybody and you know everything about the NFL. So please explain to me how the New York Giants are five and one. I I wish I could. Ed. I wish I could. I, <laughs> I actually tried to um, on Wednesday. I wrote a piece about the Giants, um, you know, got a chance to really sort of dive into them once you and I set up this show. I was like, I, I really got to take another look at the Giants and dive into their season. Um, I think a couple of things sort of stood out to me watching them and rewatching some stuff over the past couple of days. You know, Daniel Jones looks comfortable. He looks confident. And you and I talked about Jones over the weekend and how he's, like you, you put it, playing winning football. And that's true. I mean, just the two interceptions, an interception percentage of 1.3%, which right now is the lowest, you know, single season number he's ever had in the NFL. And it's one of the best marks in the league right now, as far as quarterbacks go. I think only like two or three quarterbacks are better right now with a better inter- interception percentage. And so he's comfortable. He's moving well in the pocket, even with the lower body injury that he had a couple of weeks ago. His eyes are calm and decisive. You know, and in the piece I wrote, I highlighted some plays against Baltimore where you could see him moving well, working through reads, using his eyes to influence safeties and things like that. So Daniel Jones is playing winning football, which I think is a big part of it. Saquon Barkley's, he was healthy coming into the season for the first time since, I guess, his rookie year. That's all the report that I read from you and others over you know the summer was he's healthy for the first time in a long time. And I think we saw that over the first weeks of the season. I know he's got the shoulder injury, wearing a brace for it, but so he's a little dinged up right now, but everybody's a little bit dinged up at this point of the season. He's explosive. Brian Dable's doing a very good job finding different ways to get him involved. I think the offense overall has been solid to above average. You know, you look at, you know, EPA on running plays, passing plays, they're in, you know, the top 10 in basically both categories, I think, particularly in the run game. Um, So the offense has been good. The defense has been creative. It hasn't, you know, been fantastic. It hasn't been stellar, but Wink is doing some, you know, dastardly things. That clip that Nick Filato, our good friend, put up with basically the Maryland eye over the center of three pass rushers. That, I mean, that reminded me, Mark, that reminded me of the uh, Mighty Ducks flying V. 
Yeah, I mean that's that's what it looked like to me. I mean, it's it's that's a great call. It's a great reference, and um, you know they're doing some interesting things on the defensive side of the ball. So, so I mean that's all the stuff that I think is really working well. You know, the one thing that I think is fair. You know, you and I talk a lot, and we both incorporate context a lot into the work that we do. They've done it so far against teams that are combined sixteen and nineteen. So I think that's fair to point out. They get two more games before their bye against teams that combine five and seven, Jacksonville and Seattle, which means before their bye week, the first half of their season, they're playing games against teams right now that are sitting at 21 and 26. Obviously, that switches after the bye. Because after the bye, you get Philly twice. You get Minnesota, who's five and one right now. You get Dallas again. After the bye, their schedule is against teams right now sitting at 30, 20, and one. And so we'll know more about this team, say, Thanksgiving time, right? Because you're going to start getting into that stretch. You know, you come up Houston and Detroit after the bye, and, you know, they're struggling right now. But then you get Dallas, Washington, then you get Philly. Like, that say, first five or six games after the byes, I think we'll really have an understanding of what this team is. But right now, they're playing extremely well. And you can't argue, really, with five and one. No, you can't. And I've written a little bit about this at Big Blue View. And you can you, you can look at – a lot of the statistics, a lot of the defensive metrics, they're way, they're way down in the league in interception rate. They got their first interception last Sunday, which was a right. game changer. Their, their passing attack is, you know, thank God for the Bears because otherwise the Giants have the worst passing attack in the league at this point. But if you if you look, take a deep dive into the statistics statistics there's two areas where the giants are standing out in my mind they're standing out in red zone offense where they're in the top half of the league and they're standing out in third down and red zone defense and to me that's that's credit to mike kafka credit to brian dable credit to wink martindale for the way that they're using their personnel yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. I mean, you look at, you know, red zone percentage right now. The Giants are one of the top teams in the league. I mean, they're 15th right now in finishing, you know, with points when they get down into the – when they get a touchdown down into the red zone. They've had, you know, 17 red zone attempts, 10 touchdowns. You know, that's a pretty good mark for a team right now. And then you talk about sort of, you know, points per drive. That's another area where I think the Giants are pretty good. You know, two point zero two points per drive you want to finish drives with points you know that's a top 15 number which i think speaks well to what they're doing on the offensive side of the ball and so i think offensively you're right like they're finishing drives for the most part they're doing some good things on the offensive side of the ball which has been impressive you know when you look at sort of team defense i mean scoring's down league wide right and so you know we're seeing teams sort of struggle um offensively to put points on the board but then you look at what the Giants have done on the defensive side of the ball anyway, giving up 18.8 points per game. That's a top 10 number, you know. And I think when you think about the NFL today with scoring down across the league, it used to be I, I, you would think, oh, you know, if you only give up 18 points, you know, you're doing something magical. Uh, but now you're doing something incredibly magical because teams aren't scoring. You know, it used to be 18 points might not be enough to win because teams are scoring well. Um, now – you know, you can win games that way. They're built to win sort of the rock fights. So if your offense is struggling, they're holding teams to 18 points a game, a top 10 number, which is very impressive on the defensive side of the ball. And I think I always love to look at the different ways teams can win. And I think the Giants have a different, a number of different ways they can win games right now. They can win rock fights, as we've seen a couple of times uh, already this season. And I think – you know, there are games in which you've seen this offense have some potential to put more points on the board, you know, 2.02 points per drive, which is, you know, a top 50 number in the league. That's a good recipe to give you a lot of different pathways to win games. Yeah, it uh, it certainly helps to have a, a fully healthy Saquon Barkley, but uh, who's made some, you know, some Barkley-esque plays so far this year. But I do think, Mark, that we need to – you know, because quarterback is is your thing, we need to spend a little bit more time on on Daniel Jones. Yeah. And and the the question that I really want you to answer is 
is Daniel Jones actually playing better football or are Brian Dable and Mike Kafka just managing him better and putting him in better situations? I kind of think they go together. I, I, you know, I would probably put it as like a 65, 35, 65 being it's Kafka and Dable. They're putting them in situations. They're giving them concepts that are very quarterback friendly while also stressing defenses. I mean, one of my favorite plays uh, from last week against Baltimore was a third down conversion in the second half where you had sort of a mesh with shallow crossers, then you had deeper crossers over the top of it. I thought it was a great design because you've got four receivers. You're stressing a defense with numbers. But Jones really is just reading, you know, between the numbers. You know, he's reading one area of the field, but you're still stressed at the defense. I thought it was a very nice play design, something that, you know, other teams have run, but I thought it was great to get that sort of into the playbook. And so I think Dable and Kafka are doing things to put him in a position to be successful. But I also think that he looks comfortable. I mean, I mentioned, you know, his eyes. I mentioned, you know, the pocket presence. And one of the things that, you know, Jones, for all of the discussion about him, you know, over the past couple of years and whether he's the guy and, you know, whether the Giants should just move on from him. One of the things that he's done well is throw in the face of pressure. I mean, you look at this year right now, adjusted completion percentage over a PFF, 78.7 when pressured. That is best in the entire NFL right now. But then you look back last year and on the season, 71.6, which was fifth best in the NFL. And for all that has been said and written about Daniel Jones, he's been good under pressure. And I, I, I believe that's one of the non-negotiables when it comes to playing the quarterback position is the ability to play well, to be able to deliver good decisions, good throws, take care of the football, even in the face of pressure. And Jones, you know, did that, has done that the past couple of years and he's doing it at an elite level right now. And so I think he deserves some credit for that. But I do think that Dable and Kafka have put him in a position to be successful. And I know ultimately the big question is going to be this. What do they do with him? You know, what do they do with him? Because obviously they declined the fifth-year option. And you and I have talked about this. Is the door now open for Jones to come back and to be the starting quarterback for this team next year? I think that conversation and the fact we're having that conversation speaks to how well he's done this year. Yeah, and uh... – I was actually going to go there next. I was going to ask you to uh, to trade that Patriots cap that you're wearing for uh, for for your your Giants GM. I got one around Joe, here. Joe yeah. Joe Shane hat. You know, maybe you got a Giants helmet laying around there, Mark. I don't I know. Think I do one back here, yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so the question becomes, as you said, where do the Giants go with Daniel Jones and? Obviously, if they're going to continue to win games, they're not going to have a top 10 pick. They're not going to be in the C.J. Stroud, Bryce Young. They might not be in the Will Levis you know, conversation. They might not be in that area where they can get a quarterback without giving up a lot of assets in the draft to go get one. I had initially thought that, you know, Tyrod Taylor is a guy who's a good backup journeyman sort of placeholder quarterback. And I had thought, you know, maybe you just move on from Jones and Taylor's your placeholder next year, you know, while you develop a young guy. But I've started to wonder, you know, there's an argument to be made that you build your roster and then you get your young quarterback, you know, when the roster's ready to to sort of support that guy and, and hold him up. Could Daniel Jones be the bridge for the next couple of years for the Giants as they build this roster? I, I think he could be. And, you know, obviously a lot depends on what happens over the next two months, right? Because like you said, if the season ends right now, you know, Tankathon has their draft order. They're sitting 28. Like you said, that's not C.J. Stroud, Bryce Young, might not even be Will Levis territory. And from what we're hearing about Will, Le Will Levis, the league might view him as QB1, while those of us on the outside are kind of say, wait, well, it's Stroud, it's Bryce Young. I mean, that might be more, say, Hendon Hooker territory, deeper into the first round. And then, of course, there's the Hendon Hooker age question, which is if you're drafting Hendon Hooker, you're going to want him to play right away because he's a bit older on the prospect. So obviously a lot could change. I think if they end up picking in the 28 range, 
yeah, you're going to want to roll with Daniel Jones because whoever you're probably drafting there might not be ready to go. Um, so there's a lot left to be played. But I think regardless of where they end up, there's a strong argument to be made, at least right now, that Jones could be that bridge guy because he's shown through six games of the season that you can win with him. Now, he may never be the guy that you win games because of it. I think at this point in his career, it's fair to say that he might not get there. But he might be that sort of quarterback you win games with as you build a team around him. And that at some point, two years down the road or whatever, you transition to the next quarterback, the younger quarterback. But I think with what he's shown through six games, he can be that quarterback you win games with, which is the perfect kind of bridge quarterback to have, as you said, as you build out that roster around that position. Yeah, who, whoever, you know, whoever thought that, you know, at the beginning of the season that that maybe you'd look at Daniel Jones and say, yeah, he might be worth two years and 30 million or 35 million. Yeah, it, I, I certainly didn't. I mean, I think everybody, you know, in summertime narratives are what they are. But I think everybody that said or written, wrote anything about the Giants, myself included, said, look, you know, this is Daniel Jones last run. Like, we all know that. Like, unless he does something incredible you have a new general manager you have a new head coach this was not their guy and yes they said all the right things at the combine right like you and i stood there and it's like yes he's our starter quarterback right now and they've said all the right things all off season about daniel jones he's our guy we're building around him whatever we've also seen before new coach and general manager come in they get a new quarterback that's kind of the, the cycle of the league but the fact that we're sitting here a couple of you know 10 days or so before halloween saying hey daniel jones has probably earned a short-term deal to be a short-term starting quarterback here for the Giants based on his play this year. It's not what we saw coming, but I no. think she's shown that he's earned that through his play through six games. And look, they could get to the bye at seven to one. They've got two winnable games coming up. Yeah. That's you the bye, you rest it up. You, you make a playoff run through November and December, which yes, the schedule is tougher in the second half, but there you start out with Houston and Detroit, two very winnable games. You could get to nine and one. It's gonna be tough to move on from him in that situation, I think. Yeah, Mark, don't even nine and one and Giants fans don't don't even go there because I know, but look, you, but you look, already did. You already this did. This is the era, so. era, Ed. This is the era right now of unbridled optimism. I use that quote a lot. It's one of my favorite Tony Cornarza quotes from years ago when Steven Strasburg made his first start for the Nationals and he pitched extremely well against the Indians. And Kornheiser the next day was like, welcome to the era of unbridled optimism. I just love that <laughs> phrase. And I think Giants fans can bask in the era of unbridled optimism. Your team is 5-1. and one. You got two very winnable games before the bye. You got two very winnable games coming out of the bye. 9-1 is a legitimate possibility. Now, will it happen? It's the NFL. I mean, Bill Belichick just gave us a thousand words on how great the Chicago Bears are yesterday. Like, <laughs> It's hard to win games in the NFL. We all know this, but... Not in one's a legitimate possibility. I mean, at that point, man, just strap on for the ride. Yeah, that's that's just insane. I mean, nobody saw that coming. No. And I need to ask you about Brian Dable. Yeah. Um, I think everybody was optimistic about Brian Dable coming to the Giants, especially since he and Joe Shane are coming from the same place. There's that synergy between the two guys, but you know, Brian Dable right now is being talked about as a coach of the year candidate, justifiably. I keep reading, you know, from, from various places, I, something that I never thought I was going to read about a New York Giants football team after the last few years. I keep reading that the Giants might be the best coached football team in the league. I mean, did you see... Did you see this with Brian Dayball and, and, and this coaching staff? I mean, I knew it was a quality veteran coaching staff, but I'm just curious if, uh, if, if what Dayball's done has surprised you. It surprised me that it's happened this early. You know, I think when they hired Dayball, you know, everybody, my, again, myself included, wrote, like, look, this is the, like, offensive-minded guy. You know, maybe he can turn Daniel Jones around, maybe not, but this is where the league is going. You saw what he did with Josh Allen. There's a proven record of quarterback development, whether it happens with Jones or somebody in the next draft cycle, Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, whatever. So you, I thought that there was like a long-term possibility. I never thought it happened in six weeks. And I think what really sort of stands out is he got the team to buy in week one. 
that decision in Tennessee to go for two and go for the win, I, I thought that was sort of a moment where you could see him say, look, you know, even our own general manager said a couple of days ago, look, this this is the hand we were dealt. It is what it is. Like, we're going to see what happens this year. No, he may say that. That's his job. My job is to win games. We're going to win this game right now. We're going to go for two. Yeah, everybody says maybe take the tie. No, we're going to win this game right now because I put I, I have that belief in you guys. I get you the buy-in. I get you the buy-in in week one. And I think, you know, we do so much in me on the media side, statistics, metrics, numbers, and there's obviously reasons we do that. It's a, always a useful tool. But it's an emotional game. It's an emotional game. And you need that buy-in from that locker room to get all 53 to pull in that same direction. I know it sounds outdated and silly and like I'm the old man yelling at the cloud, but it matters. And Dable got that with that decision against Tennessee. And I think that's a big part of this early start and success is that team has said, yeah, we can win games. Forget all that we hear it and read it about, you know, bridge years and bridge quarterbacks and rebuilds and cap space. And in the hand we were dealt, and it is what it is. We're here and we're going to win games and we're going to punch you in the mouth. That's what they've done. And it starts with the head coach. Yeah, I think it's that's a really good point, Mark. And I think it's interesting because I was very optimistic when the Giants hired Joe Judge. I mean, yeah. he came in like a house on fire, you know, and he won the, the opening press conference and he sounded fantastic. And we're going to do this and we're going to run the program this way and it's going to be great. And, and And I've got a plan. And in retrospect, when you look at the way that Brian Dable has connected with this roster and, as you said, gotten buy-in and been aggressive, and and he says over and over, he says it's a player's game. It's my job to to let them try to win, yeah. you, to, to, to do those things like go for two points against Tennessee. Which, and he always says things like, you know, we're going to do these things and we're going to live with the results. Whatever happens, we're going to live with the results. And when you when you reflect back on the Joe Judge era, especially the the you know, victory formation, double third, quarterback yeah. sneaks on yeah. third, you know, against against Chicago, and and just his his conservative approach overall, and and you reflect back on that, and what becomes apparent, at least to me, was it felt like Joe didn't believe in his team. It felt like he was trying to coach this team to make sure that the scoreboard wasn't embarrassing to make sure that the team didn't screw up Yeah, and, and not necessarily to go out and say, Hey, let's find a way to win this game. And I, I think that's the biggest difference right now is that Brian Dable says, Hey, you know, Maybe we're not perfect. Maybe we don't have the best roster, but we'll figure out what guys can do, and we're going to go let them do it. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Ed. And look, players are smart. You know, you've been in you've been in Giants locker room. Players know when their coach is coaching not to lose versus when their coach is coaching to win. And they also know that in the former, the coach doesn't trust them, and in the latter, the coach does. And that's a huge difference. I've been on teams, you know, again, Division Three football doesn't count. I, I get that. But I've been on teams where we could tell, look, the coaches are afraid that we're going to lose this game. And it's hard to have that confident approach you need to play this sport. If the coaches are afraid that you're going to lose the game, that's how you're going to play. You know, if the coaches are out there saying, we're going to go for and fourth down, we're going to go for two, we're going to try to win games, you have that belief that, hey, they believe in me. I can, I can go out here and do my job. I can go to play games instead of looking over my shoulder wondering if I'm going to get benched because the coaches are worried about us losing games. Players are smart. They, they know the difference. And, again, it gets to that idea of buy And I think it's sort of like the deeper philosophical conversation we see league-wide. I mean, every time there's a fourth down on Sunday or Monday night or whatever, everybody's yelling, should they go for it, should they not go for it, whatever. Part of the reason coaches might want to go for it is to get that buy-in, right, is to get – players to believe in themselves and say hey look i trust you guys to pick up a yard here i trust you guys to pick up three yards here i trust you guys to get two points here i'm going to put it in your hands i'm not going to take the ball out of your hands and so i think dable's done that and it is a huge difference between the giants of the past couple of years and the giants of this year is 
The head coach believes in his players right now. He's rewarding that faith with aggressive decisions. And the players see that and want to reward his trust in them. And I think that uh, also, you know, people ask me all the time, what happens when the Giants get more talent? You know, is with this coaching staff, and, and and you look forward to that. You look forward to another draft or two. It doesn't necessarily translate all the time, but I do think whether they get to nine and one, whether they make the playoffs, no matter how this season turns out. In some ways, I think you can argue that this season has already been a success for the Giants for the simple reason that what, they've, what they're finding out, what Giants fans are finding out is they have a coach they can go forward with. I think they have a front office they can go forward with and that, that finally it looks like they have people who can, who can take them forward. Yeah, and that's going to be important you know, when you start thinking about next offseason, right? When you start thinking about what the Giants will be able to do in, in coming years. I mean, you look at, you know, I'm looking at their 2023 page on over the cap. I mean, 61 million in cap space. That's a big number. And wherever they end up record wise, if you're a free agent, you've seen already the culture shift in New York with the Giants. You've seen now a head coach that believes in his players and is going to be aggressive. Does that sound like a place you might want to play if you're a free agent? And oh, by the way, it's in New York City, the biggest media market in the world. If you've got interests away from the field or an idea of what you might want to do in your post playing days, maybe get it into media or whatever, and you know, maybe taking my job, it's not a bad place to be. And so that's going to be huge. And like you said, regardless of where this team ends up, nine and one, making the playoffs finishing five and 12 and losing them out. I mean, obviously I don't think they're going to do that, but regardless of how they finish, they have changed the culture. They have made the giants. I think a place that free agents are going to want to play. And again, having 61 million in available cap space right now will certainly help. And so they have, they have flipped the switch. They have started this process wherever it ends up this year. I don't even know if it matters. Cause like you said, it's probably already a success and they have set themselves up for what 23 and 24 could look like. And this could be the start of something big in New York. All right, Mark, great stuff as always. And, uh, you know, make, make sure that, uh, that you, that you don't keep blowing me off so that we keep doing this. We do this a little more often, you know, you're big time in me these days. Yeah. I, I'm trying not to big time you buddy, but yeah, we'll do it again <laughs> soon. I mean, hopefully next time I can get rid of this, then I get up here in the upper lip. I mean, yeah, get rid of, get rid of that, get rid of the Patriots hat next time. Too. Uh, yeah. I, see, I kind of felt like I was going to have a Red Sox one on, but I was like, no, 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 I'm going to wear the Pats hat for Ed. I mean, and yeah, you know, yeah, it's, oh, it's, I say, it was painful for me doing that Giants piece, looking back at their playoff history, because it was like, well, second, you know, last time they made playoffs, they did this and time before that. Oh, yeah, they beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl. Yeah, that's that, oh. that's fun. It's like our good friend you'll, Dan Hatman, who loves showing off his Super Bowl reign. I, like, I don't need to see that. I'll make you feel better. I'll tell you this story real quick. I was in the Giants locker room on Wednesday. Now, realize that. The Giants, like a lot of other NFL teams, have a number of players from Alabama. Oh, right. Well, there were Alabama grads all over the Giants locker room wearing Tennessee hats on Sunday. On, I on saw Wednesday. that. I saw that a couple. Yeah. I saw Giants. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And I apparently that came from one of the Giants trainers or whatever who was a Tennessee grad and had and had made a little wager with some of those guys but uh, but yeah there were there were guys having to do their media sessions you know wearing Tennessee hats and uh, you know Xavier McKinney was like man I can't wait to That's throw this thing in the yeah. trash yeah, <laughs> <You know>? yeah. <laughs> so so uh, so hopefully that makes you feel a little bit better feel but, a little bit better hey if it happens to NFL players I can I can live with it all right, Mark, thank you as always. You, Giants fans, thank you for listening. Please remember to stay safe out there, take care of each other, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.